<laughs> Here we go again. I don't know. Are we live? Are we really live? Am I really live? Oh, looks like now I'm really live. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Well, today I want to talk about a brand new topic. One that I believe is going to become a series because I had a series of thoughts about this. The topic is what if, what if, what if something that we thought was always a certain way isn't really like that, that it's very different than what we thought. What, what about that? I don't know. I don't think I could see your comments. Oh, yes, you could see comments. If you have a comment, you can write a comment on the side there because then I know what's going on. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> it'd be nice to know if there was somebody here. Like, I know you're supposed to wait, but it's hard for me to wait. I don't have that much patience, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry on. So today's, today is number one then in a series titled, what if, dot, 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 what if. And the what if today is what if the battle isn't really a battlefield? What if the battle isn't really a battlefield? What I'm talking about is the battle of good and evil, the spiritual battle of good and evil. Is it really a battlefield? I don't know. I've been thinking, actually my own experience has changed uh, my thinking in a very dramatic way. We do think about the spiritual battle, good versus evil, as being a very tumultuous, confrontational, like really, there's no way you can mix them a little together. The minute you put evil in there, it isn't good anymore. So, yeah, sort of like oil and water, right? But still, what if that confrontation is not a battlefield, a battlefield? Yeah, but Sandra, if you look at Ephesians chapter 6, it talks a whole bunch about armor. Yes, I know it does. And it is one of the places that really had me building up over the last hmm, 50 years. I've been walking with Jesus for 50 years. <laughs> to really take on and embrace this concept of a battlefield. There's a lot of accounts of battlefield confrontations throughout the Bible, aren't there? One I think of it right off the bat is Second Chronicles chapter 20 with Jehoshaphat, where he was surrounded by five kings coming at him with their armies, and he had to turn to God. So yeah, yeah that was a battle. That was a battle. There are numbers of others as well. But just just for a second, just for a minute, let's go back. Let's just go back a little bit and consider some of those iconic, maybe, iconic verses that lead us to see our inner life as a battlefield conflict. I mentioned a couple of them. For example, Ephesians 6. All of the different parts of armor are mentioned there by Paul. Uh, I have my Bible here. I did plan to go and, and look it up. I have a different verse mark. But let me just uh, let me just go there for a second. Um, he talks about, uh, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Okay heading into battle, I need to put the armor on. And maybe like me, you picture yourself with a helmet and a breastplate. My, the breastplate I always imagined was bronze and dented, <laughs> scorched in some places, and heavy. But I'm thankful, I was thankful for that because when God looks at that breastplate, what he's seeing for the righteousness of Christ. So 
it's not all bad. It's it's not all hard. Those two words don't necessarily always go together. But to stand against the devil's schemes. Yeah. Okay. The helmet to protect my mind. The breastplate to protect my uh, sensitive parts of my body. In particular, my heart. And in the spiritual battle, of course, as I said, to me, the, the breastplate uh, is an analogy for, for Christ's work. Also, put on, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm looking down, right? To buckle on the belt of truth, gird myself up with a belt of truth. And those were not only to keep in my innards if I got injured, but also to protect and support my muscles while I'm in battle. Let's see. The shield of faith to extinguish arrows. Also, the feet, the, what's on our feet, the shoes of righteousness, I guess you could say. Uh, and to make sure that I'm not out there stepping on stones and losing my balance to carry the gospel and then of course there's the sword of the spirit which is the word of God so if you get the same have gotten the same sort of uh, illustration in your mind shut off my phone that just dinged it really does kind of fit in doesn't it it supports that mindset of a battlefield and the battlefield that I took on in my inner life was the battlefield that was uh, smoky, but not smoky from fire though, smoky from cannonballs, explosions, and things like that. And I had my armor on a lot. A lot of you have seen that with women recently, you know, care, holding their, wearing their armor, carrying a sword or bending in prayer with their hand on the hilt of that sword. And so standing in the middle of a battlefield, that's what I took on. It really, I mean, you need to be hyper aware. You, you can't uh, put down your sword. There's a din, a cacophony, sound battlefield sounds and groaning and agony from those that are injured or or grunting and screaming those that are attacking and again a haze but boy you better be alert you better be alert and have that sword ready because somebody or something is going to come at you and you have to be looking all the way around because they'll come when you least and where you least expect them so, if you carry that mindset too, it doesn't really make much sense, does it, to rest your sword, to, to put the sword down and take a little R&R. &R. <laughs> Wait a minute. No. If God takes you away from the front lines and he gives that to you, that's really great. But from my perspective in general, that's the Christian life. At least that's the way I used to think about it. And really, I think... Well, look, <laughs> I've been walking with the Lord, and I've been in the church for 50 years, and really a pastor's wife for 30. I mean, really knowing the inside of churches, I get it. And I didn't see anybody challenging that, really. Now, to be fair, that illustration kind of tucked in nicely, so to speak, with my... Uh, inner life that I was acting. I was hyper vigilant for lots of reasons from my past. And I needed to carry on no matter what. And things were coming at me from lots of different lots of different directions. And I better hold that sword and carry on or I would die. Literally I thought I really believe that. Until very recently. And in connection, again, with this idea, and it's true, there is a battle. It's going on in the heavenlies between good and evil, yes. In these days, we're noticing how that battle is breaking out into the seen world as well. So, 
behooves us, it's a good idea, it'd be helpful for us, to stop and think about that concept of a battlefield mentality. Not just the image of the battlefield or the idea of good versus evil. That, that stuff is true. It is all going on. Just remember to know the scripture. But really, I can jot it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so look. What if, though, what if that's not true? What, what if that's not true? What if we Christians, I know there's a place, you know, in God's army and we have to be ready and, and all of that. Yeah, yes. But what if the battlefield itself, the way I imagined it, the way a battlefield, well, that's what a battlefield is, what the word means, isn't true. Stop and think just a little bit. What if we go back to Ephesians 6 and we consider those articles of, of armor, the helmet to protect, that kind of limits our vision if we're not careful. I mean, it really, it's an extra effort to be able to be hyper vigilant with our eyes because we have the helmet on, but it sure does protect us, right? And the breastplate. Well, it's heavy and cumbersome, but boy, it's got a lot of protection. And, and onward. But, but what if Paul was using those things indeed as an analogy, an analogy to be sure that we're protecting our minds, but not, not with a helmet, but just using that as a comparison to a soldier. A soldier knows if he's going to be about his business to do what he's supposed to be doing out here on the battlefield and protect himself too, and watch out for his comrades. He needs to keep his wits about him and protect. He doesn't want a concussion or whatever, a wound that makes that incapacitates him. So yeah, we need to keep our minds sharp and alert and uh, aware of what this battlefield looks like as we go forward. I should say battle, not battlefield. And then on through the rest of the different parts of the armor. The belt of truth, making sure it's firmly in place. Truth is firmly in place. And the, our shoes, the shoes, the things that, the, what will carry us to where we share the gospel. And the shield, the shield of faith that we make sure our faith muscles are really strong so that when those lies come in. Just last week I heard, are you sure you're really doing what you're supposed to be doing? Like, whoa, get back, get back. I, I'm then uh, the sword, right? The sword of the spirit, gotta have the spirit with us. It's the only offensive part of the armor. So. If even all of those could still be true with a different illustration of the battle itself. And, and I'm, I'm moving in that direction. But another portion, piece of scripture that will, will take us there to this what if kind of shift in how we see things. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war. Yeah, it is a war. I, I agree with that. It is a war. For though we live in the world, we do not... Oops, this is <laughs> Second Corinthians 10. I'm starting in verse 3. We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not... Oh, I'm feeling it. Are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary... They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So the, the weapons that we're using are not literal swords. The weapons that we're using are more powerful than swords. They have nothing to do with the weapons of this world. 
swords and cannons and whatever. They don't. Instead, they're going to take prayer and go after what's going on. And this is another little piece. It, it came to me today. Here is a way to exercise these mm, otherworldly, so to speak, non non-worldly. There you go. Non-worldly weapons. It comes from today's reading in Jesus Calling by Sarah Young for May 13th. Thank me in the midst of the crucible. That means a hot burning fire. That's where they melt metal, the crucible, right? Thank me in the midst of the crucible. When things seem all wrong, look for growth opportunities. Especially look for areas where you need to let go, leaving your cares in my able hands. Do you trust me to orchestrate your life events as I choose? Or are you still trying to make things go according to your will? If you keep trying to carry out your intentions while I am leading you in another direction, you deify. That means makes God out of. You make gods out of your choices, your desires, it says, your desires. Be on the lookout for what I am doing in your life. Worship me by living close to me, thanking me in all circumstances. Now she gives the references, 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. And those are, I'm sure, accurate support. The thing for me when I read this this morning, it, it, it's just so true. I keep wanting to pedal my bicycle in my own direction and the handlebars taking me where I want to go. And every time I do that, I am doing that exact thing is escalating my will above his. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I know I need and want to be in his will. But also that each one of these crucible experiences and some, let's be real, <laughs> some of those crucible flames are hotter than others and I just went through some this week and it was really hard and it was really hot because it came from a lot of different directions one of them was hmm, trying to keep up with all of my activities and responsibilities for letting people know what I do and, and supporting women in their own move toward freedom. And I'm really dedicated to that and I could be doing something 24 hours a day and I lose track of myself. But also then came in trouble with technology and then came in this gas panic. I live in South Carolina. Did you see something about that or hear something about that? Panic City, similar to the toilet paper thing months ago. And I have less than a quarter of a tank of gas. And I, I needed to go out for, for an errand or two. One of them was, oh, I had to get to the bank. I had to get to the post office. And I decided I'd pick up a few groceries. And with less than a quarter of a tank of gas, I needed to be careful. So I did my usual, you know, save gas, save distance, save time, go to go this particular route. And then on the way back, I noticed a whole bunch of gas stations with no cars and the yellow uh, covers on the pumps handle, the pump handles, more and more and more. And I thought, hmm, might be a good idea if I find something open around here to get some gas. And then made a commitment. I realized it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to choose between freaking out which would have been so easy. And honestly, right on the edge I was. But to freak out and say, no matter what, I have to this, I have to that. I'm not going to be good until whatever. A, a little thought did sneak in. So, you know, God, if I just had a full tank of gas, this would be so much easier. I mean, I stopped myself right there. Then I knew I was in trouble like Sandra. A tank of gas, a full tank of gas, makes the difference whether you can trust God or not. Where are you standing, girl? put that down immediately and kept on driving. I said, well, if I find a place that has gas, that'll be convenient. That'll, that'll be all right. Then I was coming along the road to the grocery store. And I'd already determined I was going to get a little more fruit than I normally do. I'm not being foolish. And a couple of other items that I thought of, 
I said, yeah, I'll pick those few things up. As I came up the road, there was a gas station on the right with a line of cars right across from my grocery store. And I thought, well, that, that line is off the road. There's only two or three actually on the main road. That doesn't look like it would take so long. And there's, now Sandra, didn't you just say you were not gonna panic about this? I said, okay, all right, all right. I know, it's an opportunity to trust you, Lord. God the Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit too. I'm going to trust you. I am not going to fall into this. Because I knew if I got in the line, I'd be counting the minutes, tapping my toe. I would be overwhelmed with it, with all kinds of stuff. Nope. I know me. I'm not putting myself in that place. So I turned left and went into the grocery store. And I'll make another little confession here. When I came out and saw the line, there were a couple more cars, and I thought, now you see, if you had gotten in line, you'd probably be through there already. The little critic voice came up. And I said, nope, I made that decision to trust God and there you go. That's what I'm doing. This is an opportunity. Now, that story's going somewhere. And so that was my choice. And I went home because it didn't make sense to drive around burning up gas. I knew I had enough for a particular appointment that I would need before the weekend. One thing, I cut everything else out in my mind, out of my week. I had one point appointment that wasn't uh, negotiable. I probably had enough gas to do that and get back. So that's well, that was my decision. And that was Tuesday, was it? <laughs> yes, it was Tuesday. And things didn't change, and I could feel pressure from all kinds of different things coming in. And Wednesday, I thought, oh, I wonder how I'm going to know it when gas returns. I know it will. It'll be the right time. But again, this is an opportunity, Lord. I refuse to panic. I refuse to freak out. I refuse to let my mind circle, circle, circle. What if, what if, what if? Which is a good title for this series, don't you think? And, and so I stopped and I went to uh, State Online. <laughs> and somebody said, oh, saw a post I put up about it. And she said, oh, Sandra, over such and such a place, I got an hour ago, I got gas there. There was no line or anything. And that was my commitment. I said, okay, God, when gas is in the place where the uh, there's no line, I will go and wait there. She told me there was no line. I thought, okay, that'd be worth it. I wasn't planning to go anywhere, but I put on my shoes, headed out the door. I went to the place she mentioned, and it was no gas. It was three in the afternoon, no gas. You know, okay, I just, I'm going home, God, I don't need to play this game, I'm not, really, it's funny when we women, when we women get to the point where we determine something, I determine it's going to be just like this, <laughs> we make a way, right, I'm determined I'm not going to panic, I'm just going to go home, so I went down the road, and on the way, I did go a different way home, because it was just more, because it was just more convenient there, there was a station that was open with no line. No line that I thought well here I go so I pulled right in right up to the pump and pumped my gas of course it cost me almost twice what it normally would cost I figure that that three-quarter fill up would be about $20 and it cost me 35 it'd be a little less than 20 so $35 it cost me to fill up my tank and I thought okay this is fine but it wasn't like panic city and now I can relax. It was just, thank you, God. It's just what I wanted, no line. Thank you, God, thank you, God. I mean, I kept saying that the whole time the pump was turning and then the price didn't matter right now. Of course, now I know my life will change. It needs to change now. And uh, so I got in my car and on the way home I realized, wow, how good God is. It could have been a major, it was a major, a major threat, I have to admit. But I made my choice. I made it early on. This is a, this is a panic situation and I'm not going to play that role. I'm not going to participate in that. But you take me when you're ready and I'll be willing to do that, whatever that is, God, to wait for you. And there was my opportunity right there. And he only, <laughs> it only took 24 hours. It was 24 hours from when I heard Tuesday lunchtime 
I heard about what was going on, and I thought, what? What? Really? Oh, yes. There's no gas all along Woodruff Road. There's no gas there. There's no gas here. Like, oh, I'm not even going looking today. <laughs> and actually, my lunch friend said, oh, do you want to go now? We can go find you some gas right now. I said, no. It's okay. God will take care of me. God will take care of me. And this time, he gave me only 24 hours to wait. And isn't that a great thing to be thankful for? Now, that's actually... I got a little off there, but the exciting part about that, and I, I am still going on this idea of a battlefield, right? Battlefield. That didn't feel like a battlefield at all to me, and I'll explain, explain to you here, but just being so thankful that in 24 hours, see, God offered me, he offered me out of his grace, the opportunity to choose. You get so many choices every day. He gave me the opportunity to choose. I could choose panic. Now look, other people have different things going on in their lives and understand why it would be more of an issue for them than it was for me. I'm not judging anybody else. I'm talking about me. I, <laughs> I, I recognize pretty quickly, this is an opportunity center, an opportunity for practicing your trust muscles. And, and it was really, I really did have to push the enemy away. Actually, the way it felt was I was here <laughs> in my life and something was trying to haul me <laughs> out of there. <laughs> no, it's like, no, I'm not going to go there. I, this is where I'm supposed to be in, in the presence of my God. Don't try to pull me over. And that was so clear that that's what was going on. It's not the first time, but well, it, it's the second time that this illustration has come to mind. And it's oh so true for, for many reasons. But one, <laughs> it is a war. But it's not a noisy, smelly, fear-threatening battlefield. That's not what it is. It's a tug of war. It's a tug of war. It's a rope. It's a rope. And uh, just so you know, I mean... <laughs> good versus evil tug of war in heaven in the heavens I'm, in the heavenlies I'm sure in unseen world I'm sure it's vicious and etc cetera, etc cetera. and so it's reflected here in this life I'm talking about me personally my spiritual walk and maybe yours too just check it out but it's more like a tug of war I set my feet here I'm standing right here I'm going to live as if God exists because he does I'm not going to allow myself to be pulled into this or pulled into that. Okay, I gotta say a little something else about that. I was I was born right after the end of Second World the Second World War. <laughs> right at the end of World War II. 1947, early 1947. And that means that the entire culture, and really the globe, the, was the entire culture here in America was wrapped up in waste not, want not, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, contribute to whatever, whatever, <laughs> all of that. The idea that the world was a battlefield was really very real in the context of my birth and growing up. It was very real. So it makes sense that I would carry that and then take the biblical illustration on there of the armor. But really and truly, now that I'm living it as an adult, whole, secure, and free in Christ, I see it much more as this idea of a tug of war, where something, power, and forces, and things that I don't know, don't see, are trying to pull me away from where my commitment wants me to stand, where I choose to be. <laughs> Goes on all day, every day, have you noticed? So. There are some things to remember, though, about this tug of war. In this tug of war, in this tug of war, Jesus is already the victor. And there are scripture verses that I don't have at my fingertips, but there you go. Jesus has already won this battle. He's already won the tug of war. And in the midst of the whole thing, one of the when I first thought of this, I thought, all I have to do is let go of the rope. Well, first of all, the real first thought was, uh-oh. I better hang on tight. I better keep pulling. I better keep fighting. And then I thought, because I ask my clients this all the time. Yeah, I'm a coach. I'm a life coach. 
transformation poop. But I ask my clients on a, on a regular basis, what would happen if you just stopped? <laughs> what would happen if you let go of that? And so I asked myself, Sandra, what would you do if you just, what would happen to you if you just let go of the world? Well, it was a fair question because when I lived in my head in the battlefield, I knew what would happen if I let go of that sword. I would die. But a tug of war is a completely different thing. If I let go of the rope, if I just put it down, I'm going to stand right there. I'm going to stand there. And then I thought, if I let go of the rope, whoop, the enemy on the other side, all those kids on the other side of that rope are just going to go right in the mud. Oh, I think I'd like to see that. That would be really fun. And then I sobered up a bit and I thought, even though, just as it was for that 24 hours, really, that 24 hours, even though I was pulling hard and pulling hard and remembering who God is. I live in his favor and I'm fine in the truths of scripture. Remember? The helmet of truth. Helmet of truth. My brain is thinking about the illustration. Anyway, that Jesus is holding the end of the rope. Jesus is holding the end of the rope. It isn't even, I mean, these analogies always break down. You know, in, the, in, in here, in, in a tug of war here, the end of the rope is just plain <laughs> empty, and it could actually slip through your hands. I mean, usually you tie a knot so that you don't lose, but Jesus is holding the end of my rope, so I'm all set. So Jesus has already won the victory. Really, the battle is his. The battle is his. The battle belongs to the Lord. That's a scripture. You can look it up. But look. <laughs> That means if you do have that illustration in your mind, if you have lived there, are living there, that smoke-filled battlefield, that belongs to Jesus. That, that battle is his, not yours, not mine. He already has the victory there. That battle, that figurative battle, in reality has nothing to do with me. Sure, I pray. Sure, I use, I use all the weapons at my disposal for this spiritual battle. And trust me, I am using them. <laughs> so, let me just ask the question again. What if <laughs> what we're looking at isn't really battlefield at all? What if it's a tug of war? A tug of war that we're participating in. Okay, I'm Sandra Allen Lovelace. If you haven't seen me before, you can find me all, all over the place. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at Gmail, Sandra Allen Lovelace. And if this is something that, this dynamic is something that you've been talking about or sensing really strongly and you'd like to, some support to deal with it, to go forward in freedom, feel free to reach out to me. You can message me here, comment. You can ooh, like or share if this hit a nerve and you can relate. Go ahead and like and share or make a comment. That always makes it helpful for Facebook to spread things that there's good material. And also, you can reach out to me. I am available for what I call a clarity call. A clarity call. Spend a few minutes, 15 or 20 minutes, and you can share where you are and where you'd like to be. And we can talk about how maybe I could support you. It's all complimentary. All right, I'm gonna end this now. It's probably long enough. See you later. Oh, I'm saying end, it won't end. I will be not ending. End. <laughs> it doesn't want to end. I'm hitting the red end button. Maybe I just have to stay on life forever. Oh, hi Rhonda, thank you for that. I'm not joking. It's not letting me it's not letting me stop. Maybe I need to use my